Hello, everyone, and welcome from wherever you're joining us. I can see that people are coming into the webinar, so we, we might get going. Really glad that you could join us for this discussion on Southeast Asia and great power competition. My name's Richard Maud, and I'm a senior fellow at the Asia Society Policy Institute, and also executive director of policy at Asia Society Australia. Uh, now, before we uh, go uh, any further, I'd like to acknowledge that we have uh, people joining us from all over Australia at the moment. And in my case, I'm joining you from Canberra, the lands of the Ngunnawal people. And as is customary, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respects to elders present, past and emerging. And I extend those respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us today. Now, Southeast Asia often describes itself as sitting in the center of Asian, if not Indo-Pacific affairs. Uh, but these days, I, I wonder if they sometimes think that they would like a quieter life. For Southeast Asia is not just the center of the region, but these days, the center of intensifying competition between China and the United States. And this is a competition about power and influence. It's about economic advantage, but it's also increasingly about competing visions for Indo-Pacific order. On the one hand, America's free and open Indo-Pacific concept, and on the other, Beijing's China ASEAN community of common destiny. And both China and the United States want Southeast Asia to align to their vision of regional order. And of course, this is not just a story uh, about the great powers in Southeast Asia. All of the region's other major partners like Japan and Australia, India, the European Union uh, and South Korea are also working hard in Southeast Asia to sustain their own influence and economic and political links. And Southeast Asia is undeniably feeling the pressure of this competition. Southeast Asia's leaders have been clear in warning both America and China to manage their competition responsibly. Southeast Asian countries value their economic relations with China. They don't want a conflict and they don't want to choose a side. So in short, to go to the title of this session, they'd like to stay in the middle, protecting their autonomy and sovereignty if they can. Today, that's no easy task. And this is the complex landscape that we'd really like to explore in our discussion today. And I'm really delighted that we have a stellar lineup of experts from Southeast Asia itself to help shape the conversation. I'm also really pleased uh, today that uh, Asia Society is launching a new report looking at the conduct of Chinese diplomacy in Southeast Asia during the pandemic years of 2020 and 2021. Uh, and this report illuminates part of the bigger story we want to tell you today and suggests some lessons that the United States, Australia and Japan in particular could draw from this period. And you can access this report through the link uh, that we're sharing now. Now, quickly, let me just run through a couple of housekeeping matters. The discussion today will go for 40 minutes or so uh, but the full session is an hour and we really want to leave a good time for question and answer session. So please do submit your questions via the Q&A function. And you can also upvote for your favourite question by giving it a like. Please do keep engaged on Twitter. Our handles are at Asia Society Oz, A-U-S, or at Asia Policy. And also keep an eye on the chat box because we'll be posting some links to work that uh, recent work by our speakers. So that's enough from me by way of general introduction. I'm really pleased now to introduce my co-author of the report that we're launching uh, today, Dominic Fraser. And Dominic has kindly agreed to be our moderator for today's discussion. I'm going to stick around and join the panel. So Dom, it's um, over to you now. Yeah, thanks, Richard. And without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our amazing panelists, and then we're going to launch straight into discussion. So joining us from the Philippines is Dr. Shemaine Willoughby. 
She is an Associate Professor of International Studies at De La Salle University. Um, joining us from Singapore is Evan Laxmana. He's Senior Research Fellow, fellow very Australian there, at the Centre on Asia and Globalisation at the National University of Singapore's Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And joining us from Malaysia, but usually based in Washington, D.C., is our colleague Alina Noor. She is the Director for Political Security Affairs and Deputy Director of the D.C. Office of the Asia Society Policy Institute. Please check out their full bios in the link we're sharing now because it is very impressive and you'll probably want to ask them even more questions. So Evan, I'm going to start with you. Can you explain to us sort of the significance of Southeast Asia to both China and the US and you know, what role the, the region plays in this increased um, great power competition? What do they each want from Southeast Asia and what are they offering? Uh, thank you, Dom, and thanks for Asia Society uh, for having me today. So just a quick thought on, on that question. I think Southeast Asia is clearly significant for U.S. and China in geopolitical terms, in geoeconomic terms, and in geostrategic terms. Geopolitically, um, clearly, uh, the relationship between uh, different Southeast Asian states with each of the great power will determine the extent to which uh, the U.S.-China competition will tilt one way or the other. Geoeconomically, the large size of the Southeast Asian market and the growth in the region uh, for the next few decades, I think, will, will certainly play a key feature as well. And of course, geostrategically, in the event of a potential regional conflict, let's say, over the Taiwan Strait uh, will necessarily mean that the waterways and airspace, as well as key positions in Southeast Asia will be critical uh, for any military operation involving US and China. So when you look at this collectively, I think it's clear that if we accept that the US-China competition is a framework that remains here and it's here to stay, uh, then it is likely that the Southeast Asia region collectively and individual uh, Southeast Asian states will likely be another yet a, a battle of influence, if not a playing field for the US-China strategic competition. Thank you very much, Evan, um, for sort of, you know, explaining to us how the significance of the region and the flip side of that is, of course, how the region responds um, to this increased power competition. Um, Alina, how is the region responding and can we talk about the region as one block or are they different? Um, uh, do we really have to look at the different states and how they responding? So in short, no, we can't look at the region as a block. Uh, there have been varied responses. And you see this um, in examples like how certain countries responded to the announcement of AUKUS, for example, how other countries have responded to the evolution of the Quad, and how countries are continuing to assess um, ongoing developments between the US and China. And so I think based on those different examples, you've seen responses ranging from deer in the headlights to uh, a bit more circumspect to perhaps a little more um, measured responses that are still very much wary about how the region and regional countries are going to figure into these major power dynamics around them. Um, it's very much a wait and see approach uh, depending on the issues at large, but I think um, there's also been some introspection into how regional countries can perhaps leverage on this competition that's going on in certain areas, particularly when it comes to uh, growing the economic pie in the region. Um, not all competition is bad after all. And so you see this very wide spectrum of responses from all 10 ASEAN member states to particular developments that have taken place in the region over the last year. Thanks, Alina. And if I could just stay with you a little bit and ask you to sort of unpack this a little bit. Um, you know, you sort of mentioned the, the core issues that some are taking. I like the deer in the headlights <laughs> metaphor. Um, so what are the sort of the core issues that leaders in Southeast Asia are currently talking about and where might they disagree? So right now, the priority is on getting the economy back on track in Southeast Asia, especially in the midst of COVID and the uncertainties of possibly a prolonged COVID um, experience. I think a lot of countries are talking about COVID being endemic, but with these various variants coming um, 
around, I think we might be in for longer aftershocks. And so that's really one of the primary priority areas that a lot of leaders in the region are focusing on. And they're looking to uh, arrangements within the region, such as um, RCEP, which may or may not prove to be sufficient in trying to get the, economic, uh, the economy restarted, but also looking with interest at how uh, the U.S., proposal of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, for example, might prove a bit of a jump start. So perhaps not immediately, but uh, in the short term over the next five to 10 years. Um, and so I think these are really some of the, the main priorities and urgencies that a lot of the countries in the region are contending with both uh, public health as well as the economy. Sorry, thank you very much, Alina. Richard, did you wanna add anything to this? Uh, no, not at this stage. Thanks, Dom. Um, so I'm going to... Oh, apologies, the light just went out here. Um, Charmaine, there aren't, of course, there aren't just the great powers at play in the region. There's also middle powers like Australia, Japan, the EU. Um, what are they doing in the region and how are they perceived? Regional perceptions are indeed colored by geopolitical realities that um, Evan talked about. But as Elena also mentioned, perceptions and therefore responses vary. Now, to answer your question, Dom, I need to draw on a study in 2020 on perceptions of the Filipino strategic community. The most interesting finding of that study that is relevant to our discussion today is that despite the Duterte administration's pivot to China, only 27.6% of the respondents of that study actually preferred China as a security partner. The top three choices are, in fact, Japan, the United States, and Australia. Um, Meanwhile, the EU has always played a critical role in the region in terms of development assistance, and it's always been one of the prime destinations for travel, culture, education. Now, that being said, there are, of course, issues that Southeast Asia and these middle powers need to tackle amidst great power competition. The EU's turn to the Indo-Pacific is a welcome move, considering that we're now on the downwind with a pandemic and the fact that China China is still claiming areas in the South China Sea. Apart from this, cybersecurity and information campaigns are emerging, but critical areas and therefore strengthening cyber infrastructures can only improve the cooperative mechanisms that existing partnerships already have in place. This can likewise put partners in a better position to combat threats like terrorism and violent extremism, as well as improve the coordination mechanisms for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief efforts. Thanks very much, Charmaine, for this um, great overview. And it's so fascinating, isn't it? In Australia, I think we're so often jealous of Japan's um, role in the region and how successful it is and how well they're doing. So I'm sure we'll get to talk more about that in a little bit. Um, and just a reminder to all our participants today that you know you can start submitting your questions as they pop into your heads. Um, Richard, we've been spending the last few months looking at how China conducted its diplomacy in the region during the pandemic years. And I should say, of course, we're aware that the pandemic isn't over, but in the report, we looked at 2020 and 2021. Um, what can we learn from looking at those sort of particular um, times in, in, you know, in, in history? And can you tell us a few takeaways that, that we found in the report? Yeah, thanks, Tom. You know, it is, I think, particularly interesting time to look at uh, China's diplomacy, given the tumultuous events of the pandemic. And as we say in the report, I mean, the pandemic could, uh, could possibly have been a really serious source of tension uh, in relations between Southeast Asia and China. The pandemic spread from uh, China into Southeast Asia. In fact, um, a Thai person uh, is unlucky enough to be recorded uh, as the first official case by the World Health Organization of COVID-19 outside of China. But that didn't, that didn't happen. And I think there are a number of reasons for that. One is that Southeast Asian governments were quite pragmatic uh, about the pandemic and certainly 
uh, didn't want to join uh, with the Trump administration in finger pointing. I think another reason is that uh, the United States uh, and even countries like Australia and uh, Europe were quite inwardly focused during that period as they grappled with the pandemic themselves. But the third factor, which is the one that we really focus on in our report, is actually China's response uh, in, in Southeast Asia uh, during the pandemic. And I, I think really they turned what could have been a potential disaster for them into an opportunity. And as we say in the report, they did it in a couple of ways. Uh, one is uh, they turned up. I mean, China uh, kept up a steady uh, tempo of in-person engagement. Xi himself did not travel, but Wang Yi uh, was often in the region, and so too were other Chinese uh, senior officials, Wang Yi being China's foreign ministry, of course. And China was also there first with some of the help that Southeast Asian countries needed. They were there for medical equipment, uh, but also really importantly and significantly, they were there with uh, vaccines when Southeast Asia really needed them and the United States and Australia and the countries of the West were all buying up many more vaccines than they needed for their domestic purposes. And of course, that story has changed now. The United States, as it happens, has well and truly passed China as, a, uh, as the major donor of vaccines into Southeast Asia, and these are mRNA vaccines, not the more traditional type of vaccines. But as we say in the report, uh, the United States doesn't seem to have got all the credit it might like for that, because the region really does remember who was there for it in those early stages of the pandemic. And even if China's vaccines might not have been as effective as mRNA vaccines in preventing infections, they certainly, certainly, certainly um, saved lives. Um, another factor, of course, is an economic one. So Southeast Asia suffered, most of it anyway, suffered a quite deep recession because of the pandemic. And China's ability uh, to keep its economy mostly open and going through 2020 and 2021 was uh, an enabled China to position itself as the path to economic recovery for Southeast Asia. And indeed, as we show in the report, ASEAN's trade with China grew quite handsomely during uh, the pandemic period. And this is not just, of course, I think worth noting because of demand that was indigenous to China, but also because China was selling lots of things that it made to America and Europe, and Southeast Asia was an important supplier of the components for those things. So all of those things, the consistency of China's attention, the energy it put into it, the determination it put into it, the, the natural advantages it has in the size of its economy uh, and its proximity, um, the way it used its discourse power, it really ran pretty hard information or propaganda campaign that positioned China as a responsible great power sharing the burden of the pandemic with Southeast Asia. Uh, it kept up its courting of elites, which it does quite well. All of these things uh, were put into play uh, during the pandemic. And then just quickly, um, two final points, because uh, I think we'll, we'll come a bit more to this. Uh, the pandemic period, and this is another key takeaway from our study, also shows while China actually in the end had a lot going for it in Southeast Asia in terms of building influence, China's influence is not uh, unconstrained. Regional countries are concerned to protect their autonomy and sovereignty. They do push back from time to time. Importantly, Chinese diplomacy can work at cross purposes at times, and that's particularly evident in the very assertive way it pursued its maritime claims in the South China Sea during the period that we were looking at it. And public opinion about China and trust in China uh, is low in many parts of the region. And then finally, the region still wants to work with a diversity of partners, and that, that opens opportunity for the region's other major partners. Thanks, Richard. You've done almost too good a job at summarising the report. We still want people to go read it. Um, so please do go read it. There's also an excellent chapter. Well, I'm biased, but there's a great chapter on policy recommendations as well, picking up on Richard's last point. Um, 
Alina, I know you've just been telling us that we can't talk about the region as, as a block, um, but largely I think it's true that we can say that the region wants to stay non-aligned and in the middle, as Richard said. Um, how much longer can this be kept up as sort of great power competition increases? And is there anything that we can learn from history and how the region will respond? Yeah, there's a bit of a holdover of the term non-alignment, uh, both from within and beyond the region. And so there's a bit of a negative uh, flavor I think, that permeates that term non-aligned. And I think we all know that now the favorite buzzwords are agency and autonomy, but they're essentially almost the same thing. Um, and as you rightly pointed out, uh, Dom, there is this desire to maintain that uh, choose your buzzword of the day, non-alignment, independence, agency, or autonomy. But it's getting increasingly hard because of this squeezing of the space by the major powers, as your report points out very well. And, and part of what I really like about the report uh, is the policy, the set of policy recommendations that you propose, but I won't go into that right now because we do want people to read the report. But um, I think one of the areas in which you see this narrowing of the space is in the rhetoric or rather the disconnect between the rhetoric and substance of um, from both the United States and China in particular. So on the one hand, you have these powers talking about not wanting to put the region in a position where they have to choose. But on the other hand, as your report points out, um, in action, you see this exactly happening. Um, this presumption of one set of values being more superior to another and therefore a natural um, set of complements to what the region expects and, and models itself on but on the other hand, you also see this tension between what the region is trying to shape for itself and the models that are being offered to it. And so I think that the region has to do, the region as a block, but also individual countries within the region have to really hit the pause button perhaps and reflect on what it wants of itself in engaging with these two major powers in particular, but also other countries in the region, such as Australia and Japan, um, and trying to carve out a space for itself and, and its own future as this narrowing space becomes more intense. And you see this in the technological realm. You see this also in the economic realm with competing initiatives um, like IPEF. Yeah, thanks very much, Elena. And just picking up on some of those points, um, Evan, what what other risks are there for Southeast Asia um, as it searches for autonomy and that space, as Alina so nicely said, it, that space for autonomy and agency is shrinking um, and is non-alignment sometimes almost a, a cover for not taking positions on, on, difficult, on difficult topics? Um, I think for us right now in Southeast Asia, autonomy and agency remains an aspiration. And a lot of times uh, it doesn't really match with the reality, which is the fact of the matter is uh, US-China competition has already polarized the region in a couple of different ways. Number one, um, as Alina mentioned, there's certainly a limiting uh, of choices in terms of what uh, Southeast Asians would like to do, whether it's in the, the technological realm, economic or otherwise. And in fact, one of the main essence of autonomy is the right to be wrong. Some of our choices may not be viewed favorably, um, whether it's about a particular naval base or particular uh, technological cooperation. Uh, the essence of it is remains that um, elites in Southeast Asia want to have their own choices, whether it's right or wrong uh, by external standards. Uh, the second, I think, potential problem is obviously uh, the notion that it's not just strategic polarization at the regional level, but domestically as well, uh, that a lot of the elites in Southeast Asia are already forming blocks, those who champion closer economic engagement with China versus those who champion closer security engagement with the United States, for example. So domestically, we are already seeing the basis or, or the contours of these uh, domestic polarization as a consequence of US-China competition. Um, and I think lastly, 
there is certainly a, a danger of, um, of Southeast Asian states, not just aspirationally autonomous, but also there's a sense of complacency uh, in which we don't need to put our own resources because we're just waiting for the goodie bags from the US and China. So the lack of willingness for regional states to put their own resources, uh, whether it's defense, whether it's technology or economy, is also, I think, a risk uh, down the line beyond uh, using uh, autonomy or non-alignment for not picking sides. The complacency in which Southeast Asians uh, are, are sort of slowly moving into because they are can now safely say, we don't have to do anything, we'll always be wooed uh, by US and China, I think will have long-term uh, detrimental effects uh, to their own aspirations for strategic autonomy. Yeah, very, very interesting point. And um, on on the whole, you know, wooing the region, um, Charmaine, I wanna talk about the Philippines a little bit. In our report, because we focus on the years 2020 and 2021, we mainly looked um, at the foreign policies of Duterte, of course, um, which might best be described as erratic. And if you're not too familiar with that, go and read our report, one of the last plugs, I promise. Um, but of course, this year, um, the Philippines voted for a new president. And I was just wondering if you can tell us a little bit what his first few weeks in office can tell us about the future of Philippine foreign policy. Sure. Well, um, President Marcos met with the Chinese ambassador to the Philippines shortly after announcing his candidacy in October 2021. Um, afterwards, when he was already presumptive president, he had a lengthy phone conversation with President Xi Jinping, where they discussed shifting the bilateral relationship to a quote unquote, a higher gear. China remains supportive of the Philippines' independent foreign policy, which under Duterte tilted towards China instead of diversifying the country's international relations. Um, China also supported Duterte's flagship Build, Build, Build program that was supposed to jumpstart and reinvigorate the country's infrastructure projects, but ultimately it did not really bear much fruit. Now, President Xi's preference um, seems to be for private talks to continue at the bilateral level ra rather than at the multilateral level. This inclination has consequences for the Philippines' policies in the South China Sea. Um, the Philippines actually needs to engage at the multilateral level rather than at the bilateral level to leverage the 2016 arbitration award regarding the South China Sea. Um, now, President Marcos' um, first State of the Nation address is going to be on Monday, July 25th. I can only guess what he's going to say based on his inauguration speech last month. Then he gave very bro broad strokes and very general statements. It was the same call for unity that propelled him into office, but no details whatsoever on, on implementation. The ambiguity is consistent, but it also runs the risk of non-transparency. In the same inauguration speech, he touched on Ukraine, reprising the narrative that the Philippines is blameless and wants to be friends with everybody. This implies neutrality. Now, whether or not this, this neutral position will continue is going to be a wait and see. I also expect that there will be a lot of nostalgia from his father's rule, which likely means that the narrative of the golden age will continue to be his springboard. Finally, I can, I can only hope that um, his first state, state of the nation address can be delivered in Filipino rather than in English, like his inauguration speech, so that he can connect to the 31 million Filipinos who voted for him. Thanks very much, Charmaine, and thank you for um, previewing the, or putting out your wish list for his speech. There's still time <laughs> to implement those for his team. Um, and thank you for mentioning um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I think, um, you know, that has sent such shockwaves around the world and, you know, obviously different responses in Australia compared to um, many in Southeast Asia. But Alina has the invasion had an impact on how the region sees its own security? This is a tough one because it depends who you ask. Uh, there are people who tend to 
equate or analogize what's going on in that part of the world, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, with what might happen closer to home in Southeast Asia, and specifically in, with regard to the South China Sea dispute. Uh, I'm personally not very persuaded by that analogy, but uh, I think there are also broader concerns about obviously the, the economic impact, uh, food security impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And so there are concerns that are percolating in the minds of policy leaders in Southeast Asia about how to prepare for contingencies that may or may not occur, but are nevertheless uh, good to keep in mind for the future. Uh, so really, again, because Southeast Asia is so diverse, it depends which country you ask, it depends which policymakers you ask, and at what time of day, right? But I think uh, what the invasion of a country like Ukraine has done is to wake up some of the policy leaders in Southeast Asia as to um, even completely unexpected uh, events that may occur that were not on the radar before. Thanks very much, Alina. Um, Richard, back to the report. <laughs> in it, we um, tried to assess whether China managed to increase its influence in Southeast Asia during um, the last couple of years, what we call the pandemic years. Um, has it been able to, and does it matter? Yeah, the answer to the first question is, um, it depends <laughs> where, where we're talking about in particular. So yes, we, we did have um, a go at some judgments about the net effect of China's diplomacy in the pandemic, particularly in the case studies we did were on Indonesia, the Philippines and the Thailand. You know, I should say up front that measuring influence is uh, very hard to do. It's, it, it's inherently subjective. So what we've come uh, to is a series of judgments or, or estimates. Uh, and they are our judgments alone, but I might mention here that we did benefit enormously from talking to a range of um, Southeast Asians, including Southeast Asians in those three countries. Uh, you know, this is this is our report and our view, but those those conversations were an essential part of what we were trying to do. I think in Indonesia, we came uh, both of us to a pretty clear conclusion that. Um, uh, China had a good two years in 2020 and 2021 in Indonesia that it had won ground uh, and built influence. We thought uh, the story in Thailand and in the Philippines was more complex, uh, less straightforward in some ways. I won't um, go into detail as to why. Uh, people can have a look at the report and see how we tease out the issues. But interestingly enough, we, we thought that in terms of those two pandemic years, China really neither, neither won ground nor lost ground in Thailand when it came to building influence. Uh, and in the Philippines, we actually thought it might have gone backwards on some measures, uh, particularly in the, in the last stages of, of the Duterte uh, administration. But we do, we do also say that those are point in time judgments and in both countries, that is in both Thailand uh, and the Philippines, the, the longer term context here, I think, is uh, steady gains in China's influence relative uh, to other partners. And the long term trend, we think, does favour China for some of the reasons I mentioned right at the beginning. Now, does that matter? Well, you know, the key uh, factor here, I think, is the ability and the willingness of Southeast Asia's leaders, current and future uh, to continue to uh, juggle agency, autonomy, sovereignty, uh, to borrow the words that we've been using, with rising uh, Chinese influence. It's not easy to do, as we've been discussing. Uh, and in our report, we found examples where Southeast Asian governments were prepared to push back against China, but we also found plenty of accommodation of China's uh, interests or just issues where governments weren't prepared to, to take a stand. Um, so one plausible future that we look at in the report, not, not predestined, it's um, not certain, but uh, it's at least plausible is a future where uh, we see uh, creeping accommodation of China's interests in Southeast Asia that inevitably comes at some expense um, of the sovereignty, agency and autonomy 
of the region's own countries. And in that kind of future, uh, it could matter to the rest of us, but could, could because we could see a China emerge with a stronger veto power, is the phrase we use in the report, um, over aspects of Southeast Asian foreign policy and engagement with other countries. And in case our listeners think that's far-fetched, uh, China already uh, tries to shape the foreign policy of the region uh, routinely. It, it definitely has mixed success in doing so, but there are a number of examples in the report where, where we show how China sought to influence the, the way in which the region engages with or cooperates with other partners. So the consequences of that are, are potentially significant. If, if the region always looks first to China, then the rest of us lose a bit more, we get crowded out a bit more, it's harder to support our security and economic interests. I think there are also, uh, that's my last point here, important consequences for Southeast Asia as well. Um, you know, Evan made the point, a very important one, that uh, that the, the Southeast Asia is already divided in some ways, polarised about how to deal uh, with this uh, challenge that with um, a more assertive and influential China and with rising major power competition. And I think in that alternate or plausible future we've mapped out, some of those divisions could become more acute. The stresses on ASEAN uh, unity uh, could become uh, ever more evident for um, Southeast Asia's other partners, getting things done in Southeast Asia could be harder and gaining Southeast Asian support for uh, the kinds of principles that are actually embedded in the region's own foundational documents like the ASEAN Charter and the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation could, could become harder. Thanks, Richard. Um, Evan, one of the one of my last questions, and I'm going to turn it over um, to the audience. And I see the questions already coming through, which is great. Please keep them coming. Um, Evan, one of the reasons that we came to the conclusion we did with regards to Indonesia is that we really saw a sort of shift from 2020 to 2021 in terms of how the Indonesian government responded to um, incursions, Chinese incursions in the North Natuna Sea. And I know that you recently wrote a great paper. Um, on this issue. So I was just wondering if you could talk us through some of the issues around the North Natuna Sea and how that impacts the relationship with China. Sure. Um, first, I think uh, the Chinese behavior in the North Natuna Sea is certainly not just uh, an elite affair. Um, in another uh, study I did uh, with the Lowe Institute last year, uh, where, we, where we surveyed uh, the public opinion in Indonesia in late 2021, we actually found that the way the elites have presented China has uh, has influenced how the Indonesian public increasingly have a lower uh, uh, view of, of China compared to the United States. I think for the first time in a long time, um, uh, Chinese uh, favorability uh, perception across a uh, range of, of, of questions and indicators are actually worse compared to the United States and the North Natuna Sea is certainly one feature of that. A second feature I think is that despite um, the recurrence of crisis and dare I say escalation in how China uh, pushes uh, the strategic boundaries in the North Natuna Sea with Indonesia, I think the Indonesian government's response has tended to be haphazard, incoherent um, and uh, very unstrategic if you will. I think there is a perception that for Indonesia, uh, we don't have a problem with China in terms of actual disputes because we don't uh, stake a claim in the South China Sea dispute. So therefore, uh, the incursions are simply an operational maritime law enforcement problem. And I think this has hindered a much wider strategic response to, to China's behavior. Uh, of course, it has been exacerbated by the lack of strategic coherence uh, within Indonesia's own strategic, eco, uh, strategic policy ecosystem in which uh, the different tools of statecraft, whether it's political, economic security, or foreign policy sort of goes their own separate ways in responding to China. Because at the end of the day, I think Indonesians are more interested in toning down the crisis rather than preventing one. 
So therefore, I think we should be able uh, to say that we are likely to see more um, uh, crisis down the line, uh, whether it's about uh, specific uh, fishing um, incidents or maybe even uh, further than that, as we've seen uh, lately in terms of the challenges to Indonesia's uh, sovereign rights to explore natural and gas uh, within um, the North Natuna Sea. So for the time being, I think until Indonesia's strategic policymaking system is uh, fundamentally revamped, uh, I think we should not be uh, seeing a more strategic response uh, from Indonesia uh, to China's uh, uh, gambit in the area. Great, thank you very much, um, Evan, for laying that out so clearly for us. And um, the link to your paper, as well as Charmaine's um, papers, has been shared as well. So for anyone interested, please do take a look. I'm now, we're now going to go to um, your questions and thank you very, very much for sending them through and for keeping them short so that I can, I can keep up <laughs> with them as I go. Um, the first question is from Muhammad about um, the AUKUS alliance and how that has impacted um, how Southeast Asia and Australia um, sort of view the region and whether that impacts future cooperation, if I understand this question correctly particularly um, around Indonesia and Australia. Um, but maybe, um, Charmaine, would you like to take this question? You don't have to talk specifically about Indonesia, but whether um, the AUKUS alliance has impacted Southeast Asia and Australian ties. Sure, I, um, I would love to answer this question. Um, so obviously, you know, the Philippines is not part of either AUKUS or the Quad or any of these minilateral arrangements that have emerged recently. Um, but the impact on the Philippines is largely connected to its being an ally of the United States. Um, so um, the, the, the impact or the consequences will really be measured in terms of how strong the Philippines and the United States can continue or deepen or strengthen their, their alliance. The alliance has been questioned or challenged very, very much during the Duterte administration. So the, the hope, and again, I go back to you know, aspirations, um, would be that under the Marcos administration, the boat would be not rocked as much as it was in the previous administration. Thank you very much. And Evan, can you tell us a little bit how Indonesia has saw the AUKUS announcement? Uh, I think there's there's two lines of thinking there. One is sort of the substance of, of the AUKUS arrangement itself. And the other one is sort of the communication in how uh, that was announced and sort of unfolded. Um, certainly there's a lot more um, acrimonious comments about the communication part because that happened shortly after a two plus two meeting between Indonesia and Australia. Um, and kind of the narrative that comes out of Australian officials saying that, oh, oh, oh uh, we're not uh, neglecting ASEAN, uh, it's all good, um, also can be seen as, as condescending at times um, uh, for some policymakers in Jakarta. So the communication part, I think, is certainly uh, left many uh, uh, um, uneasy. The substantive part about AUKUS, however, um, is sort of, I think, sh still shrouded um, in um, concerns whether or not this will end up being, as some Australian officials uh, claim, that this will be an open architecture that allows regional partners to participate in whatever shape or form, particularly with regards to defense technology, I'm very skeptical of this, but we shall see. The second part is whether or not this leads to strategic overcrowding in which the calculations of, of extra regional powers like the UK and the United States have to be factored in seriously in how Southeast Asians, including Indonesia, uh, think about its own strategic problems around the region. And of course, uh, the issue of strategic overcrowding relates, I think, that um, to the fact that Privately, some Indonesian policymakers don't really fundamentally object to it because I think we understand it's not like Indonesia or ASEAN is offering ways to improve Australia's relationship with China. Uh, we don't have a lot to offer in that sense. So we understand uh, that Australia is offered is obviously free to make its own strategic choices. Um, and also, you know, it's not the worst thing that um, there could be the possibility that this will uh, uh, at least complicate China's own uh, strategic designs in the region. Uh, but I think uh, for the most part, the concerns that 
Indonesian policymakers have over AUKUS is simply the uncertainty, right? The uncertainty that comes with a much more integrated security arrangements with extra regional powers. And of course, the bigger question is whether or not this ultimately leads to an escalation in US-China competition. Now, for a lot of regional policy analysts, US-China competition is the framework and we have to win it. But for some in Southeast Asia, it's not about winning it. It's about how do we tone it down and in fact escape it. Uh, so this fundamental broader questions of regional order, I think will be a strategic divergence uh, between Australia and Indonesia. If the bilateral relationship is great and strong, does that necessarily translate to convergence over US-China competition? I think is a question mark and it has been a question mark uh, uh, for the two countries. Thanks very much, Evan. Um, picking up some of your themes there um, towards the end. Alina, we've got a question on, um, on sort of soft balancing um, in terms of, you know, uh, regional and extra regional alliances like AUKUS and the Quad. Do you think some of those balancing acts um, can, can turn into traditional hard balancing military alliances? I don't see the Quad evolving into something like that at the moment in its current form. It's not to say it would, but I just I see that possibility as quite remote right now, given its work pillars uh, surrounding global public health, climate change, um, sort of public goods for the world, if you will. But with AUKUS uh, in particular, there is that possibility of turning into something harder uh, in terms of military cooperation is very much there. Um, I think, though, it will take the form of more scientific and technological cooperation in those military affairs. And you've seen as a first step the uh, transfer or, or planned transfer of uh, submarine technology um, to Australia. And so you see also from statements that have come out from the AUKUS leaders about greater work and cooperation on um, things like quantum and cyber and AI and nano, um, those are all technological advancements that will really shape the way military affairs uh, are conducted in the region in the next 20 to 50 years. But more importantly for the region, I feel, is the governance framework or governance frameworks that will underpin some of those technologies that countries in Southeast Asia should be paying closer attention to. Capabilities and capacity uh, limitations are going to prevent Southeast Asian countries from being a part of this open arrangement if the quad ever becomes that. But I think participating in some of the discussions about these governance frameworks, the rules of the road, if you will, is going to be key to how Southeast Asia shapes its role and its destiny uh, in and around arrangements like AUKUS. Thanks very much, Alina. Um, Richard, this next question is um, for you, and I'm taking two together because I think it's really interesting um, how they're juxtaposed. So one person says, the influence of China is inevitable given its growth and history. Whereas the next person says, do we underestimate the fragility of the Chinese system? So Richard, um, thinking of those two statements taken together, can you um, walk us through of sort of the, the challenges that Southeast Asia faces as there's increased demands on it to choose sides, as we heard earlier, um, and whether you know, we are overestimating or underestimating China? Yeah, great questions. And um, there are <laughs> as many views on those questions as there are days in the year and probably more. So I'll, I'll just give you a quick personal perspective. I think it's undeniably true that there are uh, pressures building uh, inside China, particularly on the economic front. Uh, you know, it's quite startling to hear some seasoned commentators say that the economy looks in worse shape that, than it has been at any time in the past 30 years. There's a lot of debt in the economy. There's a, a, a demographic uh, time bomb that's going to hit China soon. And, you know, I think all of that uh, bears watching and it will be fascinating to see how the party 
rises to those various challenges, which, which they're very conscious of themselves. I think you can accept uh, that the Chinese model is not bulletproof, uh, but still argue, as I would, that whether or not China is growing at 2% a year, which, you know, 2 or 3% a year, I think is at best at the moment, uh, or 5% a year, it's still going to become uh, bigger in relative terms to the rest of us, including the United States. I think that's still likely. Uh, and it's still going to be, um, whatever its internal challenges and problems, an immensely uh, powerful country. And it comes to Southeast Asia with all of those advantages that we talked about, a proximity of the tying of Southeast Asian economies into China and so on. So, you know, I do think it's inevitable that, that China will be very, very influential in Southeast Asia. You know, it, it, it may well be, uh, it, it already is in some parts of Southeast Asia, the most influential country. But I think I'm going to flip now and perhaps come to the, the second question, which is uh, accepting even that, I, I don't think we should be fatalistic about it. You know, I think there, there are plenty of, um, uh, of Southeast Asians who are, who are working hard to try and find their own way through this. There are, as I've said, examples of the region exercising um, agency and autonomy. It, it's an exceptionally difficult uh, task for them now, but, but they still do want to try. And there is still opportunity and space uh, for the rest of us. In, in a way, you know, our, you know we, we can't do much, if anything, about uh, China in Southeast Asia and the way it builds its influence, but we can do a lot about our own engagement of Southeast Asia. You know, that is what is in our control. And if we want to sustain our own relative influence, if we don't want China to have a veto power in Southeast Asia, if we want uh, Southeast Asia to look to us as well as to China, uh, then we have to invest in those relationships and in the region seriously uh, with good in, intent and respond to the priorities of the region. Thanks, Richard. And um, Charmaine, picking up on this sort of theme of, of resilience, um, there's a question on um, Southeast Asia's economic opportunities and how, um, for example, French shoring of manufacturing amidst, amidst supply chain diversification um, can allow the region to, to balance out against the fear of sort of antagonizing China. So I imagine, I, I think the question is getting to what sort of possibilities are there as the region's economic growth um, accelerates to, to um, stay in the middle. Right, so it's, it's undeniable the very intricate economic links that Southeast Asia has with, with China, which is also why, you know, making a choice between either the United States or China is really very, very difficult. And in fact, um, not grounded in reality in, in the region. So for a country like the Philippines, for instance, it then becomes even more critical that we have, an, um, at least for the new administration, a, a sound economic policy, a sound foreign policy um, to help balance these, these interests between you know, security, politics, and also to find our way as we navigate our way between these two great powers. Thanks, Charmaine. And um, Evan, there's an interesting question here on why should Chinese influence um, be harmful? Couldn't it also lead to mutual growth for the region? Would you like to respond to that question? Uh, thank you. Um, I think it's it's certainly an interesting uh, uh, question. Uh, this is the same issue whether or not, for example, if we talk about resilience, are we just talking about political resilience against Chinese influence or also against American influence or against Australian influence? And I think as a matter of principle, uh, when we talk about political interference in domestic policymaking, certainly um, Southeast Asians should develop uh, resilience against all kinds of foreign influence, not just Chinese. Um, but whether or not influence uh, uh, is good or bad is, is sort of loaded in the sense that what is important for growth or um, shall we say 
uh, a positive trajectory of a particular country is an influence, right? It's about whether or not it comes, for example, uh, economic cooperation. Is it a lot of commitment, but no realization? Is economic uh, engagement uh, followed by debt and so forth and so on? So what is important for growth is the terms of engagement rather than the terms of influence. So the terms of engagement part, I think, is where a lot of Southeast Asians are still struggling, not just with China, uh, but with the rest of the region as well. Uh, and there's there's a lot to be uh, desired um, uh, for sure, but that I think is a problem of the extent to which domestic policymaking uh, in Southeast Asians are geared for uh, the massive uh, geoeconomic changes, for example, in terms of, of financial technology, uh, fourth industrial revolution, and so forth and so on. Now, influence, I think, if I think of about foreign influence, not just Chinese, but in general, I do think about the extent to which external partners try to shape uh, certain policies. And this is um, as old as international relations. All countries do that. Uh, my worry is that influence is then utilized to accept certain types of economic projects that are economically not viable, or at least it creates more uh, economic problems down the line, and whether or not uh, a political influence are then used uh, to resolve certain types of, let's say, maritime disputes uh, at the expense of the wider international rules-based order. Now, these are, I think, the kinds of issues that we need to assess on a case-by-case -case basis. It is hard to say that um, all Chinese influence or all Australian influence are automatically bad or good, uh, but I am more interested in understanding the case-by-case -case terms of engagement. Thanks very much. And um, unfortunately, we have so many amazing questions, but we are coming to the end of the program. And I would like to um, end on a sort of fire round, picking up on this idea of, um, you know, giving the, the region options so that they, you know, they can choose on, on the terms on which they like to, to have this engagement. Um, so in about 20 seconds each, um, what is the number one thing that the region's other major partners, so you think of the, U the US, Australia, Japan, can do to um, help the region sustain its autonomy and agency? Alina. Uh, listen, and I think that uh, is being done right now, but continuing to listen and um, to also take on some of the opinions coming out of the region is key to ensuring that Southeast Asian countries and leaders are able to sustain that agency and autonomy. Brilliant. That sounded like it was almost exactly 20 seconds, Richard. <laughs> I've blown some of my time by being on mute. Uh, to me, uh, probably the number one priority is, uh, is, is economics. I mean, that is the region's most urgent priority not just to recover from the pandemic, but to keep growing so that uh, so that Southeast Asia can escape the middle income trap. And that's going to be very hard for them. So the more that South, uh, Southeast Asia's other partners can do to help support sustainable economic growth, then uh, the better. Thanks, Richard. Charmaine? Um, external powers should tap both the bilateral and the regional levels. While improving state-to-state -state relationships is important, external powers should still find ways to work with and perhaps recognize the centrality of ASEAN. Thanks, Charmaine. And Evan? Uh, stop talking about China, uh, subtly or otherwise, and figure out what we need rather than what you think we need. Great. Thanks very much, Evan. I'm picking up very strong um, listen to us vibes here. So thanks very much for that. Um, thank you so much to Richard, Charmaine, Evan and Alina for this fantastic panel. Um, it, it's a very, very interesting region and topic to watch. I do have to mention it one last time. Please go and read our report. Um, and, you know, please get in touch if you have any questions or comments. Um, we would we would love to hear from it, from you all. Um, before you all go off, um, I should mention that today's host, Asia Society Australia, has a number of programs and events coming up that are accessible um, to the public. Um, so tomorrow we're going to um, continue with our focus on China. Sorry, Evan. Um, with our China executive briefing, Engaging China on Health Policy, asking what can Australia read from Beijing's policy signals on health?
then next week, um, we are lucky enough to host Alina again as she launches her own report, Raising Standards, Data and Artificial Intelligence in Southeast Asia, doing an event in partnership with the ANU College of Asia and the Pacific. And then finally, in August, we are ho hosting our inaugural Young Leaders Forum. Um, please sign up to um, receive Asia Society Australia's updates and invent invites. And finally, I would like to thank our board, advisory council and members for their continued support. And of course, the Global Asia Society team. Um, it's been a massive effort in bringing this event out. Um, Asia Society does have 14 global offices and everyone is um, working closely together. Thank you very much to our panelists and thank you very much for listening and engaging with today's session.